Guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen zu dieser ersten Plenarsitzung des 46. Jahrestreffens des World Economic Forums. Es ist mir eine besondere Ehre und Freude, dieses Jahrestreffen mit einer sehr wichtigen Stimme beginnen zu dürfen. Nämlich, wir haben hier als unser ersten Redner das Staatsoberhaupt der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Herrn Bundespräsident Joachim Gauck. Herzlich willkommen bei uns. Herr Bundespräsident, Sie sind im Osten Deutschlands aufgewachsen. Sie sind Pastor. Sie haben sich immer vom damaligen kommunistischen Regime Distanz gehalten. Sie haben auch in der, nach der Wiedervereinigung eine bedeutende Rolle gespielt, um das Unrecht, to make sure that uh, the uh, lack of right could be uh, rectified. And now, since March 2012, you are president of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany. In your capacity as uh, president, you have often, uh, without becoming overly political, taken a very strong position on very important issues. And today, Germany and Europe is uh, in our heads. We know that you're dealing with the refugee crisis. You've got the problem of identity versus solidarity. You've got the problem of Europe, integration and uh, problem of disintegration. You've got some very important issues which you have uh, to address. And I'm sure that this is something uh, that is going uh, to mark the history of uh, Europe this year. So we look forward very much uh, to hearing your speech, President uh, Gauck. Can I ask you to come and uh, make your speech at the podium? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Schwab, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to address this forum today. In bringing together people who feel committed to no lesser a task than improving the world, Professor Schwab, you have made Davos and this forum a place without equal, a forum of ideas and of exchange between society, politics and the business community, all of them united in their wish to master the major challenges of our age. And this year your discussions will be focusing above all on how the fourth industrial revolution can be managed. Looking at your wide-ranging agenda, I was struck once again by how closely our global community is interwoven at so many different levels and by how many interdependencies already exist. This is true in particular of the rapid digitization, the increasing connectivity of the world. Today I'd like to look at one particular form of the increasing connectivity of societies and mutual global dependencies. According to the latest study by the World Economic Forum, the world's major concern in the immediate future will be refugee flows. Almost 60 million people, more than ever before, are currently fleeing, often at great danger to their lives. The hundreds of thousands of people seeking protection on our continent are presenting the European Union with uh, its biggest uh, ever test. Migration is not a new phenomenon. It has occupied both policymakers and society since time immemorial. People have always uh, been on the move. 
And their motives for doing so have remained unchanged for centuries. The desire to escape poverty, squalor, unemployment or oppression, persecution or war, or perhaps also to improve themselves, or out of a sense of adventure and curiosity. Whatever the reason for it, migration has always been associated with hope. The hope of a new, a better, a secure life. In many cases, uh, ladies and gentlemen, migration has been an engine for progress and economic growth. Most economists believe that labor migration in particular has brought opportunities for increased prosperity, not only for the migrants, but also for the receiving countries and the states of origin. The economist John Kenneth Galbraith once described migration as the oldest action against poverty. Additional workers help create value added. The desire to improve one's situation produces new dynamism. A look at the list of uh, American Nobel laureates and uh, Oscar Prize winners shows just how much a country can benefit from migrants' creativity, including all it does between three and four times uh, as many immigrants as people born on American soil. Contrary to what we used to believe, poorer countries of origin also benefit from the emigration of uh, talented people. Losses can often be balanced out. On the one hand, by the money migrants are sent home, and on the other, by know-how and education gains if the migrants uh, then later return to their home countries. The speed at which a whole society can benefit from migration is shown by the 25 years of strong economic growth enjoyed by the fledgling Federal Republic of Germany after the end of the Second World War. Germany, which had lain in ruins, uh, developed into uh, an economic uh, miracle. It only, not only absorbed refugees and displaced persons from the former German Eastern territories, but shortly afterwards it deliberately recruited millions more, the so-called guest workers, who wanted to go back to their countries of origin after a limited time spent in Germany. As we all know, things turned out differently. Some of uh, the guest workers uh, started uh, to settle in Germany and have uh, contributed uh, to prosperity in Germany. In the 1970s, however, a lot of uh, these uh, migrants uh, lost uh, their jobs during the recession. In the end, the receiving society too paid a price because it failed uh, to integrate the migrants and to give them access to more education. And at the same time, it failed to call for efforts towards integration on their part. Sometimes such omissions have an impact right down to the third generation in the form of education deficits and unemployment. Similar developments, social exclusion on the one hand and self-encapsulation on the other, can be seen in other European countries too. Furthermore, not all migrants have espoused uh, all the uh, fundamental European beliefs and convictions. This is true in particular of some people who have either come or their families have come from Muslim countries. And uh, this uh, obviously has an impact on their role of, uh, or their perspective of the role of women, on tolerance, the role of religion, and also on our system of law and order. The failings are especially obvious in areas where enclaves have developed, where the values and rules of a democratic state based on the rule of law have been circumvented or even replaced by fundamentalist uh, convictions and uh, extremist behavior. One key lesson from our own history, but also from recent European migration history, is therefore this. Migration and integration must be thought of in tandem. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is currently experiencing large-scale migration provoked by violence.
The arrival of hundreds of thousands of people fleeing war and conflict, persecution and massive human rights violations. Allow me to say this quite clearly. It is our humanitarian responsibility to take in such victims of persecution. In most states, this responsibility derives from the Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees, and in Germany the right to asylum is also anchored in our constitution, the basic law. We must not think in terms of usefulness with regard to these asylum seekers. People who need our protection are allowed to cost us something. A society which regards itself as a community of solidarity will act in a spirit of solidarity in, refu in relation to refugees too. If we were to shirk this self-imposed obligation, it might bring some financial gain. But we would be losing something of great value, namely our respect for ourselves, our sense of being at ease with ourselves. I know that many of you watching Germany viewed the behavior of uh, countless uh, Germans last summer and autumn in uh, 2015 as either emotional exuberance or naivety. But for us Germans, and I would like you to think this over, this behavior testified to something more. For many older Germans, the willingness to give the new arrivals a welcome was an expression of a commitment to a country which, after its steep fall, wants to be open, to show solidarity, and never again to become xenophobic or racist. For larger sections of the younger population, this natural openness was the fruit of their positive experience as Europeans and as citizens of the world. And many who themselves came from families with migrant backgrounds offered uh, their linguistic skills. This all made for an uplifting experience. At the same time, however, I am of course aware that even if civil society has achieved something extraordinary in many places uh, during the last few months, the readiness to demonstrate solidarity is not infinite. What society and the state are able to achieve, and how long they can continue to do so, depends on many factors. How well the economy is doing, how great a state's institutional, financial and social welfare capacities are, how big a cultural and social gap has to be bridged, and how willing the refugees are to integrate. Not least, it also depends on how much experience a society has with migration and the integration of uh, migrants. In Germany, we have only recently begun uh, to discuss uh, openly the fact that receiving societies are also affected by migration. Regardless of whether the migrants stay temporarily or permanently in Germany, regardless of whether we're talking about refugees or migrant workers, a large proportion of the native population sees migration less as a boon and more as a cause of uncertainty and the loss of a familiar world. New arrivals bring with them different customs and views, different languages and religions, and in some cases different values into everyday life. Those who come to us uh, should feel at home in an alien country. The former president of the German Bundestag, Wolfgang Goethe, said recently. But he added that uh, the native population shouldn't feel alien in their own country. As a rule, after people get to know each other, they come to accept one another. Sometimes, however, conflicts develop. Following recent events in several German cities, for instance, it was feared that fundamental achievements of our civilization, such as tolerance, respect, and the equality of women, could be damaged. 
It was also feared, and this is even more problematic perhaps, that the state was no longer always able to uphold law and order everywhere. It appears, therefore, that migration is politically viable only to the extent that citizens are willing to accept it. People must believe uh, that uh, politicians have uh, the ability to think uh, forward and uh, that uh, the citizens are prepared to go along with and to accept the change. If uh, we think uh, about uh, the uh, absorption capacity of a society, well, it's not a mathematical formula and there is no mathematical formula. I think that we need to, to realize uh, that uh, you have to have a negotiating uh, process uh, within society and uh, within the political sphere. In Germany, for example, 10 uh, years ago or 20 years ago, it would not have been possible, it would not have been conceivable to do what we have uh, done today. However, even today, we are discussing limits in terms of the number of people we can absorb. Politicians have to reconcile citizens' desire to see their society continue to function and a humanitarian approach on helping those in need of protection. That could mean that policymakers have to develop and implement strategies to limit the number of people coming to our country, not as a knee-jerk defensive reaction, but as an element of responsible governance. A limitation strategy may even be both morally and politically necessary in order to preserve the state's ability to function. It may also be necessary in order to ensure that refugees receive all the assistance they require once they have arrived in our country. Limits are as such not unethical. Limits help to maintain acceptance within society. Without acceptance, a society is not open and not willing to take in refugees. And it is precisely for this reason that uh, the German government and the governments of other European states and even Brussels are looking for ways to stem the tide of refugees. Those pursuing inhumane policies, rife with resentment, argue in favor of closed doors, which is what many populists in Europe want. Our actions, in contrast, are guided by another objective especially as we want to provide as much protection as possible, at some point, as problematic and as tragic as it may be, we will have to refuse to take in everyone. Another point, if Democrats do not want to talk about limitations, then populists and xenophobes will ultimately set a limit. The increase in votes for right-wing populist parties in nearly all European countries, almost daily in some cases, violent attacks on refugee accommodation in Germany starkly highlights this danger. Our need is to discuss these in society. We cannot uh, leave this uh, to right-wing uh, parties. We cannot allow them uh, to deal just with the concerns of the population. Population. No, the whole of society must deal with the, these. The democratic middle, the open discourse needs to take place in the centre of the political spectrum. Now, let me at this point uh, take uh, another point which I'd like to share with you. Humanity or humanitarian principles are being uh, put to the test at different levels. Those who come from the Middle East and who manage to make it to Europe are just a minority of the many at risk who have been displaced. My visit uh, to a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan over a month ago confirmed me in my belief 
that most Assyrians want to stay as close as possible to their homes so that they can return as quickly as possible as soon as they can. They do not want to come to Europe if they can find somewhere to stay and, if possible, an income closer to Syria. Assistance for refugees, and this will apply most especially if uh, the flow of refugees into Europe is curbed, will require much greater efforts beyond our borders. So let us step up our efforts, whether they be at to the level of government or civil society, to help these people in transitional situations. Let us also step up our efforts to find a, pre a peace settlement in Syria which enables the people of that country to make a fresh start. Ladies and gentlemen, anyone who talks of limits cannot be silent on the subject of borders. In the European Union, the external borders define our common area of freedom. Protecting the external borders must not, under any circumstances, result in us sealing ourselves off. But we should carry out checks and manage our external borders. Openness must not lead to the complete disappearance of borders. However, borders are no longer forbidding if bridges or gates are established to allow in those who have a right to enter our country. Continent. The freedom of movement within the Schengen area can only be preserved if security is guaranteed at the external borders. Conversely, and developments during the last few months have shown this, if the external borders are not effectively protected, national borders will once again become important. And freedom of movement within Europe will be at risk. In Germany, too, a growing number of people no longer want to rule out national border checks if and as long as the European borders are not sufficiently safeguarded. A good uh, solution would not uh, be uh, the loss of this uh, freedom of movement. Can we not come up with a better idea than this? Ladies and gentlemen, no other problem has divided and jeopardized the European Union as much as the refugee question. I understand that the assessment of how many refugees can be absorbed is different in each country. In France it is different than in Poland or Germany or Italy. I understand uh, that uh, in Central European societies, which found themselves in a completely new political landscape 25 years ago and had to fundamentally adjust uh, to the new conditions, the fear of change as well as concerns about preserving national sovereignty and identity are especially great. However, I find it difficult to understand when countries whose citizens once experienced solidarity as the victims of political persecution now deny solidarity to those fleeing persecution. I also find it uh, difficult to understand why renationalization is seen as a solution at a time when globalization is leading to every or ever stronger international links, not only in the flow of goods and capital, but also through the mobility of people. Not only would I like to see European states showing solidarity with Germany, which is bearing such a heavy burden, I'd also like to see a discussion in which the citizens of Europe do not put all their strength and imagination into shaping a retreat into national solutions, but rather into ideas for a Europe in which everyone feels included and by which they once again feel represented. A Europe which offers better political and economic prospects to everyone than any individual nation-state. No one, absolutely no one, can want to see the great historical success which has brought Europe peace and prosperity collapses as a result of the refugee question. Nobody. Nobody can really want to see that happen. Thank you.
President, I've got a number of uh, questions that have already been uh, noted, but in uh, your very balanced presentation and in your analysis, I think uh, you've already addressed all the questions that I wanted to, to ask you, either directly or indirectly. You spoke about Europe, you spoke about Germany, but I do have a question that I'd like uh, to put to you. You spoke about uh, the uh, question of limiting the number of uh, refugees who are allowed in. And you also spoke about uh, the question of acceptance by society, the fact uh, that this uh, limitation strategy also has uh, a moral component. You said it is morally acceptable. Now, last year, there were a million refugees who came to Germany, and the numbers, uh, if they were to be extrapolated uh, on the basis of the January uh, figures, these uh, figures lead us uh, to believe uh, that we will probably have uh, exactly the same number, another million uh, this year. Perhaps uh, we may even exceed that number. So my question is the following. In fact, I've got two questions for you. First is, do you believe that the limitation strategy of which uh, you spoke, do you think it is necessary today? Secondly, what can we do if uh, we decided uh, not to limit the number of rivals, what could we do to prevent uh, these massive uh, flows of people, which may amount to one million or more refugees coming uh, to uh, Germany? In answering your first question, the Federal Republic of uh, Germany has to be very careful, so I can't really deal with operational policy. So let me just formulate it in this way. The discussion in Germany is uh, such that we probably can expect that different forms of a control will come into place uh, this year, because that the concern that the same number of refugees will come as we had last year, or perhaps even more, and that Germany would have to deal with uh, this problem. That problem has been recognized uh, by all sections of society. The coalition in Germany, the Grand Coalition, has had a very lively discussion on this issue. And so I think that uh, it is uh, extremely likely that forms of control and limitation will be introduced uh, whatever form they take, and they will have uh, to be introduced. At the present uh, time, uh, government is uh, looking at ways of uh, just processing all the uh, refugees' uh, papers and applications at the moment. But people are very worried. But I think uh, that uh, we should not uh, think about what the people in the right fringe of society. But you also have uh, highly committed uh, mayors and uh, volunteers who are starting to say, we are doing all this work, but I don't know how we can do more than what we're doing already. So I'm expecting something uh, will be done. And that is why your second question is so important. It has to be clear that uh, if uh, we are to show solidarity and we're prepared to do so, we've also got to make sure that uh, we increase our efforts uh, beyond our borders and we can show solidarity by providing support uh, in the area uh, around uh, Syria and uh, Iraq, for example, in Turkey. And we have supported efforts uh, at the European level in order to ensure that we can improve people's lives in these areas. Now, I was in Jordan recently, and I was uh, introduced to a project where you have uh, Jordanian and British authorities working together. Now, perhaps we could think of creating some kind of free trade zone, for example, where people would uh, come together, work, producing perhaps refugees and Jordanians, working side by side, and uh, perhaps uh, they would be able to have uh, better conditions in order to allow them to export their products to Europe so that they can really learn to support themselves. That is simply one example of how we could really go to the conflict areas and do something to improve the living conditions of the people who've had to flee their lands. So solidarity doesn't stop at our borders. And all I can do is to appeal to ensure that uh, uh, the reticence shown towards uh, UNHCR and uh, the World uh, Food Programme, that the attitudes of people to these organizations uh, change.
I think uh, we need to, to provide uh, support, we need to step up uh, efforts, and this is something that needs to be discussed uh, in society. We're helping people at home, but we're looking beyond our borders, and we need to do that all the more so if uh, we do not uh, succeed uh, in finding some kind of political or military solution and end the war. In fact, uh, the United Nations should uh, be in a position uh, to uh, fight uh, IS uh, so that peace uh, can return to Iran and to Syria. But I think that we all see with some concern uh, that uh, the United Nations uh, cannot uh, do more than it's doing at the moment, and we don't see uh, a, a robust uh, mandate uh, being given to the UN. So I think uh, that is why the support uh, that I've been referring to is so important. Mr. President, from your own experience, you've always uh, fought for basic fundamental beliefs. And I think that there are certain basic uh, beliefs uh, in Europe uh, which are uh, at stake in Europe. And I think you mentioned this in your speech. But for our non-European friends, perhaps you could just uh, say a couple of words to explain what for you those basic rights which we want to preserve are. In my speech, I said that I would like to see Germany and uh, Europe continuing uh, in their position towards solidarity. I could not imagine uh, Germany without that uh, solidarity. And that is based on the conviction that uh, human uh, life, as defined in the UN uh, Charter, is uh, something which really should uh, get the maximum protection we can provide. And I think that this is not just an ethical principle which we must uphold and which uh, derives from many religions, but I think it is also clever political thinking. I do not believe that uh, we can have a future where you have one group of uh, countries uh, which uh, preserves uh, human values and which uh, shows solidarity, and another group of countries which uh, is uh, building up military strength, uh, which is uh, trying to fight enemies, and uh, which uh, simply want to preserve their own personal interests. I think uh, the history of uh, humanity in the First uh, World War showed uh, that it was necessary to create the League of of, uh, nations. After the Second World War, we had the United Nations, and we had a very clear path. And it was uh, decided uh, that political action and ethical values had to come together. That's what we need to, to pursue. And I'd like to add something. Why do I believe? I think I said this in my speech that if you think of limitation, you think of something restrictive, but I think it is morally acceptable. And perhaps I can uh, just borrow the words uh, of uh, the president of uh, the uh, Evangelical Council in Germany, a bishop and social ethical uh, worker. Bedford Strom is his name, and he once said, a social form of ethics which has never had to uh, face a test of time is not social ethics. And I think that if you have a heart and if you want to show enthusiasm, enthusiasm for good things, then you also need uh, to take into account that we always have limited forces, and we can only do good with limited forces. And unless you are aware of this, then our desire to do good can fail and can lead to, to massive frustration, such uh, that uh, all uh, our activities in order to achieve good are simply destroyed. And uh, we cannot allow that to, to happen. We've got to ensure that the people who are committed uh, can continue to that. But we need uh, this uh, sober uh, idea of what is possible. Thank you very much for coming to us, uh, President. I think it was very important uh, in this very first uh, session that we should have addressed this issue. I think that over the next uh, few days uh, we will be talking about the effects of the industrial or the fourth industrial revolution. But precisely here, it is important uh, that uh, we put the humanitarian aspect at the forefront. And that is what you've done in your speech. And we're very grateful to you for that.